welcome to I24 News Defense Magazine. I'm Alon Ben David with your weekly review of security, intelligence, and strategic affairs. In this edition, we discuss the proposed ceasefire in Yemen, set to take effect tonight after months of intense fighting between a Saudi-led coalition and Iranian-backed Houthi rebels. We also examine the laws of war with a focus on last summer's seven-week conflict between Israel and Hamas. And last, we set our sights east on Moscow, where a major military parade marked 70 years since the end of World War II, in which an estimated 27 million Russians were killed in some of the bloodiest battles against the Germans. Let's begin. We begin with Yemen, where a Saudi-initiated ceasefire is set to take effect in less than an hour. However, much uncertainty remains, with fighting still intense in the lead-up to the truce. I-24 News correspondent Shai Ben Ali has more. A sliver of hope, or yet another cynical twist in a tragic plot. Shiite Houthi rebels accepted a Saudi initiative for a five-day ceasefire in war-torn Yemen Sunday, even as fighting continued across various locations in the country with airstrikes by a Saudi-led Arab force pounding targets. The ceasefire, if it is indeed upheld, is only scheduled to come into effect later on. We have made a decision that the ceasefire will begin this Tuesday, May 12, at 11 p.m., and will last for five days and is subject to renewal if, it's, if, it, if it works out. The uh, ceasefire will, will uh, end should the Houthis or their allies not uh, live up to the uh, agreements uh, it contained in this issue. The Houthis are allied with certain elements in the Yemeni army, still loyal to former President Ali Abdullah Saleh. An officer belonging to one of these units noted that despite the agreed truce, any attack undertaken by forces under the command of serving President Abdurrabu Mansur Hadi would be met with force. We took to the streets against the enemy and against the blockade on the Yemeni people. We will struggle and resist, and we will sacrifice our souls for Yemen, and we will not flee. As the countdown to Tuesday continues, Saudi-led airstrikes hit ex-President Saleh's compound in the capital of Sana'a. He, however, appears to have escaped unharmed, with this photo going viral over the past day. This cameraman was caught up in the bombing. Thank God we survived. It's a miracle. While we are covering the story or the house of the former president, Several missiles were fired from airstrikes, and I think one of the journalists was injured. The scheduled break in hostilities is intended to enable humanitarian aid to reach a beleaguered and long-suffering population. There is hope the humanitarian break will develop into something more substantial. The Houthis have signaled their willingness to open peace talks facilitated by the UN, but have rejected the notion of these taking place in the Saudi capital of Riyadh or any other country involved in the military effort against them. It is often the case in the Middle East that the hours ahead of an expected truce are among the most violent. Those caught in the crossfire will be hoping for an exception. I'm joined now in the studio by Hezi Simantov, Arab Affairs Correspondent for Israel Channel 10. Good to have you here. With uh, Sana still controlled by the Houthis, why did the Saudis went for a ceasefire? The Saudis needed the, the ceasefire because of uh, the American pressure and the other Arab countries' pressure on the Saudis, on Riyadh, on uh, King Salman ibn Abdul Aziz, to give a humanitarian ceasefire. Now, the uh, Houthi rebels decided to agree to, uh, uh, to this uh, ceasefire, but the fighting is still going on because the ceasefire will be uh, only tonight. So what are the chances that it will hold tonight? Very small chances, and even if uh, this uh, ceasefire, this humanitarian ceasefire would last, it would last only for a few hours because of the fighting in Sana'a, the capital, and Ali Abdullah Saleh, the former president, who supports the Shiite, the Houthi rebels, are continuing. They, are, they have now an achievement. They just, uh, the Mor uh, Moroccan F-16 fighter jet was uh, shot down by the Houthis, and they want to, show, to uh, uh, b give more achievements to the rebels. They are shooting rockets, small rockets, into Saudi ground, into Saudi soil, and they want to continue. Their appetite is very, very strong this time. They see the Saudi uh, decision to maintain the ceasefires as weakness. So w can we say whether the American stands? It seemed tough to decide with their tightening ties with their new friends, Iran. I think the Americans don't stand uh, any uh, choice here. They don't have any influence now on this ongoing ceasefire here or not, because there is a, uh, a, a dispute 
between Saudi Arabia and the United States, between President Obama and King Salman and Abdul Aziz, due to the GCC summit, which uh, King Salman will not attend. His absence means that the summit is, is failed? His absence alone is a slap in the face of President Obama. The slapper is King Salman. That's what he meant to do? Of course, of course. And he meant to uh, that all the media will know that he is not coming. He is not coming. And three other leaders are not coming. Only two leaders, only Kuwaiti leader and uh, Qatar leader are coming to the summit. Four leaders of the GCC are not coming because of King Salman. The Saudi king is not coming. There was a phone call between King Salman and President Obama, but this phone call, this uh, phone call does not mean that there is okay, that it's okay. The situation is uh, now fine between the two leaders. There is a very, very big dispute between Saudi Arabia and Americans because of Americans' support or eagerness to sign a deal with Iran. <laughs> Now to Europe, where the newly developed Airbus Air 400M military transport aircraft crashed during a test flight in Seville on Saturday, killing four people. The Air 400M was developed for seven European NATO nations at a cost of 20 billion euros in Europe's largest joint defense project. Here's more about the possible effects. It has been described as the most versatile military transport plane currently available. The Airbus A400M can carry personnel, hold 37 tons of cargo, and can even serve as an air-to-air -air refueling tanker. Previously in high demand, the aircraft's reputation took a hit over the weekend following a horrifying crash in Spain that left four people dead. While its first official flight was in 2009, Airbus announced the operational launch of the new innovative aircraft in 2013. This day, today, we celebrate the consolidation of a big challenge that started something like 20 years ago. We celebrate that the A400M is reporting for duty. The Airbus military transport plane crashed outside Seville on Saturday, prompting Britain, Germany and Turkey to ground Europe's latest Air Force vehicle. The European plane maker took orders for 229 aircrafts between January and April of this year, beating out its biggest commercial rival, Boeing. French, Spanish and British authorities are calling for a thorough investigation into what caused this industry-changing plane to smash into the southwestern Spanish city, which is the home of the Airbus 400M manufacturing facility. It is almost one year since Israel and Hamas fought a seven-week battle, the fiercest of the many conflicts in Gaza over the past decade. Operation Protective Edge saw both sides accused of war crimes by various NGOs as well as the United Nations. Among the many claims was the use of human shields by Hamas and the targeting of, civ of civilian installations by the IDF. The next piece takes a deeper look at the legal aspects of war. Last summer's Operation Protective Edge was one that captured the attention of international media. A war that was sparked by rocket fire from Gaza towards civilian territory in Israel led to an IDF ground invasion and ended in bloodshed. More than 2,000 people were killed in the seven-week conflict, the majority were Palestinian civilians. Both Hamas and Israel have been accused of breaking international law and committing war crimes during the operation. A conference was held last week in Jerusalem which focused on the main reasons for the mass bloodshed. Human shields were a main tactic used by Hamas during the operation and left the international community with many questions about the legalities of war. But what exactly is a human shield? To send them to stand on the top of the roofs and to warn IDF soldiers not to shoot buildings, um, to uh, uh, cover, uh, the terrorists cover themselves with civilians uh, not to get attacked by the uh, IDF uh, soldiers. Um, and that's, that's a war crime. One of the panels at the Law of War conference specifically dealt with ways an army should approach the use of human shields, what is legal and what is ethical. The ideal situation is to attack an enemy objective without being deterred by human shields and without killing those shields. Sometimes that's possible. It demands high levels of training, intelligence, surveillance and technical capability. But on the real battlefield, often it will not be possible and civilian casualties will ensue. In the months following the operation, many investigations, internal and independent, attempted to examine IDF conduct. 
The veteran group Breaking the Silence published its own report recently. It includes testimonies collected from more than 60 soldiers with many accounts of Army misconduct experienced in person and questions raised regarding civilians during wartime. <laughs> שזאת אומרת, כל בן אדם נמצא בסביבות 200, 300, 400 מטר מאיתנו, הוא לא אזרח. כנראה שהוא בן אדם, לפי הגיון הצבאי, כנראה שהוא בן אדם שיש לו מה לחפש שם, כי אזרח היה בורח, ולפיכך אנחנו רוצים להרוג אותו ואנחנו לא צריכים אפילו אישור. While many different accounts of the operation have been given, one thing is certain, guidelines for circumstances like these must be established. There is um, a, a must, there is a need to act to call, to have a discussion about the how to apply this international law. Because if we assume that the international law has to apply to such type of conflicts, which is between a military to a terror organization, the rules have to be adopted. I recently had the opportunity to speak with retired U.S. Army Lieutenant General David Fridovich, former Deputy Commander of U.S. Special Operations Command, who attended the conference in Jerusalem. Here's a part of our conversation. One of the most pressing, pressing issues facing the Israeli security establishment and in light of the recent understandings in Lausanne is the Iranian nuclear program. In the past, you cautioned that military strikes against Iran could be counterproductive. Is this still what you hold to be true? That's a great question. I think right after I made that uh, statement, I had a lot of uh, conversations from, from here in, uh, in Israel. And uh, Amos Yadlin, I think, he and I spoke afterwards, and uh, he said, you know, you should never take anything off the table. And I think that was one of the biggest influences I had, that, you know, um, I believe that you always have to have the ability to use all your capabilities, then it's a matter of whether you have the resolve or not to do that. So, you know, I don't think they're necessarily counterproductive anymore. I think that you need to know, or everybody needs to know, that, you know, you can use them. The damage, the apparent damage ties between the current governments, are there impacting also Israeli-American security ties? I believe that, especially the last five years of my military career, from about 2007 to late 2011, uh, we built and continue to provide almost 52 to 54 special operations unique events every year. And I don't think the number has changed that much uh, to include very close senior ties. So uh, in my heart of hearts, I believe that it's as strong as ever and will remain that way regardless of uh, administration or politics, that soldier to soldier, sailor to sailor, special operator to special operator, we're still very, very close. Today, the West is dealing with multiple security challenges, many of them new, new that requires different strategies and tactics than uh, what was used in the past. What are the greatest security challenges facing Western countries today, and how can they be dealt with? Well, I think, you know, in your question is, your, is in your answer, uh, the greatest uh, challenges they have is not understanding the environment, the new environment that they're in. Uh, I alluded to in my speech this morning here uh, at the conference, the Law of Land Warfare Conference, that understanding the operational environment and what we're dealing with in the West is very similar to what's been dealt with here routinely since Israel has become a state. And I, I think people need to understand, not in Israel, how Israel feels on a daily basis, or just now getting that feel of the threats that might promulgate their way. And I think that's one of the biggest uh, underestimations that the world is making as to the proliferation of these threats. How are the terror tactics used by groups like ISIS and Boko Haram changing the rules of engagement from a Western standpoint? A absolutely. And I suppose if you ask me, you know, how, it's the fact that they can work outside the rules well, they have no rules. They do, as I said again in the speech, it becomes a video game to them. They can do whatever they feel they want to do, and they know that we're constrained. We're constrained by territory, we're constrained by law, we're constrained by social mores and, uh, and rules and ethics. They are not. So every time that there's an opportunity, uh, we come to the war with the rules we have, not the rules we want. We then have to go back and say, look, things have changed, the world's dynamic. We need to finally get out ahead of it, and I think that's why the, this conference is so important. Thank you very much, General Fridovich. My pleasure.
Thousands of Russian troops marched across Red Square in Moscow this weekend in a huge military parade marking the 70th anniversary of victory over Nazi Germany. An estimated 27 million Soviet citizens were killed in the 1941 war, which was launched by Hitler in contravention of a non-aggression pact he previously signed with Stalin. Western leaders boycotted the event in protest of Russia's role in the Ukraine crisis, by pre but President Vladimir Putin was joined by about 30 foreign dignitaries, including Chinese President Xi Jinping and UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon. And that's all we have time for. Be sure to visit us again next week for another edition of I-24 News Defense. For all the latest headlines, log on to www.i24news.tv. We leave you with the images from the Red Square. Have a safe night from Jaffa Port.